Welcome back brewers and beer lovers to Flying Wombat TV, the channel all about beer, banter, and bloody good time. So today we are back for another brew day, and this time we are remaking the Pina Colada Pale Ale. Sort of a pale ale. We're gonna do a split batch. So we're gonna do half as a pale ale, and we're gonna do half as a sour, because we wanna see what the AB test looks like with different yeasts. Anyway, we made this on the channel a long, long time ago, but it was before we were releasing recipes. So this time we're gonna do the whole thing again, and of course, release the recipe for you guys so that you can brew it yourselves at home. Let's get stuck in. We're ready to go. So let's start mashing in and I'll briefly start talking about the grain bill for this one. So let's unplug that so I can get this out of the way somewhere. Uh, put you there. All right, and rolling. That's a lot of grain dust. Let's, let's. <laughs> <laughs> let's not, uh, wait, ah, bloody hell, go away. <laughs> I was gonna say, let's not waste anything. Okay, let's get into this. So, um, the grain bill for today is pretty Nipah-esque because we're making a pina colada pale ale and sour, whatever, we need a creamy element to it to actually make it feel like a pina colada. One part of that is gonna be the coconut shavings, which are gonna go in in the whirlpool stage of all of this. The other part is we are using a bunch of oat and wheat. So, as we start throwing all this in there. Oh, for anyone that's new to the channel or new to brewing in general, this part's called mashing in. Basically means you put all the grains into the mash tun, which is your hot water vessel, and then you mix it all up. So in this case, we're gonna be mashing in with 10.5 kilograms of grains, which is, if I'm not mistaken, 21 pounds. And in uh, 30 liters of strike water, I don't know what that is in gallons. 10? I have no idea. Eight, eight gallons. No, no clue. <laughs> Anyway, at 65 degrees Celsius, sorry, 66 degrees Celsius for one hour. So the grain bill for today, we are using quite a lot of oat and wheat. So eight kilos is just regular pale ale malt. One kilo and 50 grams is oat. One kilo and 50 grams is wheat. And 400 grams is medium crystal malt for that sweetness, body, etc. But the whole idea here is that the oat and the wheat is gonna provide a really silky, creamy body so that this beer has that creamy texture, almost like a really, you know, coconutty pina colada. And we kinda need that, otherwise it's not gonna feel like it. And then, um, oh, actually, you know, something I should mention is we are using rice hulls. If you have not used these before, these contribute zero sugar, zero flavor, zero color to your brew day. But what they do provide is basically a bunch of like little tiny springs that separate all the grains a little bit more. The reason why you want to use something like this on a brew day, like for something like today, is because oat and wheat has a lot of glucan, uh, gluc uh, glucan? No, what's the thing that people are intolerant to? Glucose. Glucan. Glucose. Glucan. Glucose. Gluten. 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 Whatever. It's got a lot of gluten and stuff. <laughs> Basically, it means that there's a lot of uh, a lot of unfermentables in there and a lot of things that add a lot of body, a lot of proteins and sugars that add a lot of thickness to it, like porridge. So the problem with that on a brew day is that you can get something called a stuck sparge, which is basically where you end up with a bit of a porridge type situation and the liquid can't actually drain through properly. So what these rice hulls do is basically push all of these grains apart just a little bit more so it actually allows that water to just flow through a little bit more nicely. Especially useful when you're using oats. Oats are, I mean, you use these to make porridge, so you can only imagine what they do on a brew day. Anyway, let's start mixing some of these guys in. And uh, FYI, the reason why we're mixing a little bit at a time and then adding more is because if you are, again, new to brewing, if you jump all of your grains in all at once and then you try to mix it up, you can end up with a thing called dough balls. Basically means you've got a clump of grains that are wet on the outside, dry on the inside, and just losing efficiency. So you're not getting as much um, out of your grains as you could be. Anyway, let's uh, get the recirculating arm on. Twist it this way. 
What this thing is, is basically a pump which just recirculates all of these grain, all of the liquid around, so that during the mashing stage, it keeps the temperature more even, helps the liquid to keep moving through the grains and get better extraction. And um, you know, when we need to transfer into the fermenter later, we can just pump through this. That's basically all this does. But if your system doesn't have this, don't stress. You honestly don't need it. It's just a nice to have, not a need to have. Last little bit. Yeah, I was getting too hot to wear the jumper. <laughs> too hot now that you're working out. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh! <laughs> the Wombat has six packs now. <laughs> of beer. Of beer. Still beer. <laughs> but less rolls. <laughs> <laughs> If you do like the jumper I was just wearing, or this shirt right here, our website is now live. So you can actually jump online, get some awesome Wombat merch and join the club, but you can also use our website as uh, uh, your own recipe library. So all the beers that we make on the channel, we release onto the website. We've got a bunch of calculators on there, so you can do things like ABV, hydrometer corrections, um, stripe water calculations, all that type of stuff, as well as use the, the website as a hub for all things to do with Flying Wombat TV. So if you do want to go check that out, we'll put a link down below and um, you know, we'll see you on there and you can get geared up in your own Wombat gear for the next brew day. Okay, we have now finished mashing in. We're just gonna place our top screen on here. This thing basically allows us to just keep all the grains in there and then we can recirculate the wort over top. Um, out, that is very hot. I'm gonna put this thing on here. And it is now time to start your clocks. So, one hour, 66 degrees Celsius. We'll come back after that and we'll get to sparging. Mashing is done. So now we are straining this out and thanks to those rice hulls, this is straining out very, very quickly and easily, which is awesome when you use this much oat and wheat. So now we need to start sparging. So we've got our hot liquor tank here with uh, water sitting at 80 degrees Celsius. So what we're gonna do is batch sparging. Basically, we're gonna pour out a little bit of water at a time over the top of this grain bed until we've done 35 liters of sparge water in total. And whoops, starting with two and a half. So bit by bit, strain this over the top and basically sparging is just running extra water over the top of your grains to squeeze out all of those extra sugars because the grains kind of act like a sponge and you kind of need to wring it out a little bit with some water to really get all the soap out of it. Same way with this, you need to just give it some water, strain it through, get the extra sugar out. We are now at boiling, so it's time to start our clocks, throwing 40 grams of Northern Brewer into the boil. Whoops. In it goes. And then at 15 minutes left in the boil, we're gonna come back and throw in our whirl flock. And then at zero, we're gonna flame out, drop the temperature down to um, about 80 degrees Celsius. And then we'll throw in all of our flavor and aroma hops then and let that sit and you know hop steep for about 20 minutes. So we're at the start of our boil now, and we've got 55 liters of wort boiling away in here. So it's time to take a little gravity reading just to see where our levels are at. and where we might potentially end up with this batch. Also useful to do this before you start a boil, like now, so that you can actually figure out how many IBUs you're adding to your beer, so how bitter you're making your beer at the end of it. I'll explain more of that later. So we are currently at bang on 1.05. Do you wanna try and get a photo of this? Nah. No? Okay, we're well, bang on 1.05. I suspect we'll finish up around 1.054. And then if we ferment down to about 1.012, we'll end up with somewhere in the ballpark of a 5.5% beer, if my math serves me right. Anyway, so about, about banging the money for where we kind of want it to be. Pina colada boil is done, and I was unorganized, and I didn't set up my chiller coil. So I'm going to go heat off, and I need to quickly set up our coolers so I can cool this down. I'll be back. <laughs> we are using the plate chiller today. Uh, what it basically means is, oh, come on, go on. Actually, why am I using this? Oh, whatever, I'm using this now. Um, what it basically means is the beer goes in one side, or the wort goes in one side, the water that's cold is flowing in the opposite direction, it's surrounded by a bunch of plates and passes through them with the cold water, so it cools it down. It's basically the same thing as a counterflow chiller, which is hooked on stuff. Ah, oh, Same thing as a counterflow chiller, just more compact and kind of gets more cooling done in a shorter amount of time. Anyway, let's start pumping this thing through. Oops, I haven't connected this. <laughs> that could have been. I'm a mess. 
<laughs> I'm a hot mess. And there we go. All right, now we can connect this thing up and start pumping through. That was smoothly done. When are we well pulling? <gasps> uh, soon. <laughs> what okay, so we're gonna cool this down to 80 degrees Celsius. Then we're gonna throw in our whirlpool hops and then stop cooling it down. So if we stop the cooling at 80 degrees, it will cool down a couple more degrees if we stop the pump at 80 degrees. So then we're gonna whirlpool somewhere between 75 degrees Celsius and 80 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. Those whirlpool hops, Amarillo, Galaxy, Azacar, and Eldorado. So the Eldorado and the um, Amarillo are also Lupo Max hops, which I've explained before on the channel, but it basically means they're uh, biochemically engineered hops to carry much more hop oil, much more alpha acids, so basically just delivers a bigger punch, more flavor using the same amount of hops. Anyway, we're gonna throw these in once this reaches 80 degrees Celsius, leave for 20 minutes, we'll come back after that. We're ready. <laughs> so we are now down to 80 degrees Celsius. It's time to throw in both our hops and our massive amount of toasted coconut. So this was toasted for seven minutes at 180 degrees Celsius in an oven. That's all there is to that one. So I'm gonna throw the hops into the hop spider. And I'm gonna throw the coconut shavings just into the tank. So here, this is the, uh, the mash tun that we use the grains. We pop that back in there because I've done this before without it. And trying to um, pump this thing with a whole bunch of coconut shavings blocking the pump is just, oh, it's such an absolute nightmare. So uh, I'd recommend use whatever you can to help you filter out these coconut shavings before they reach your pump. Otherwise, you're gonna be in a world of trouble trying to transfer this thing into the fermenter. Anyway, we're gonna leave this now for 20 minutes. At the end of that, we are good to transfer this into our separate fermenters to do our AB testing with different yeasts. All right, the pina colada is now finished with its hop steeping, whirlpooling, whatever you want to call it. So now, come on, go down. We are going to start cooling this down to yeast pitching temperature, and then we're going to transfer it into these fermenters. So, because we're going to treat it like a proper AB test, nothing's going in the stainless steel today. They're both going to go in identical fermenters so that we can get a true representation of everything being the same, brew day the same, same wort, same hop, same absolutely everything except for the yeast. So, um, yeah, let's cool this down and get to transferring. There we go. That is a very, very nice colour and it smells... Oh, it smells so good. So all the aroma from the hops is coming through and it's like that sweetness of like, you know, pineapples and, and just like uh, passion fruit, oranges, all that kind of like sweet zestiness mixed in with that toasted coconut. Oh, it smells so good. All right, quick gravity reading. Let's see where we are at. And the results are in. 1.056. What was the reading before? 1.05. 1.05, okay, yeah. So pretty much on the money. That will finish up, I reckon, 5.6 to 5.7% ABV. So nice, happy days. We are now coming out of the, um, the chiller coil at yeast pitching temperature. It's coming out at 25 degrees Celsius, so we can start transferring into each of these fermenters. Uh, we're just gonna start pumping into one and then the other and get the liquids, get the liquid levels exactly even. After that, we'll pitch our separate yeasts. So in this one, we'll whack the Philly yeast, the Philly sour yeast, and then in this one, we'll whack the, um, the US 05, so an American strain of, uh, of uh, you know, pale ale yeast. Anyway, we'll transfer each of these over. Once we're done with that, we'll pitch the yeast and then we'll let them get to fermenting. Now, once we have done that, at about the, ah, oh, my knees are giving out. <laughs> at about the uh, seven to 10 day mark, we will throw in a bunch of coconut shavings and pineapple puree. So it will be uh, 900 grams of pineapple puree going into each fermenter and half a kilo of toasted coconut shavings also going into each fermenter. We'll let those sit in there for another four days. By that point, we'll be taking gravity readings. Once it's stable for three days in a row, we'll transfer into the fermenter, uh, into the keg, and then we'll be pouring it on tap and seeing which one actually comes out on top. 
I wet myself. <laughs> Someone yeah, wasn't paying attention. <laughs> ah, it's not a brew day if there's not a bit of mess. <laughs> there has to be a bit of mess. <laughs> that is transfer complete. They're about equal levels. Can you, I can't see it's on the other side. What is the, the volume at? It was around 21.5. Nice, okay. So we'll get a full keg out of each one, awesome. So, Philly Sour Yeast. Gonna go into this one over here, and I need to remember to label this. <laughs> and then <laughs> USO5 going in this one over here. So just an American strain of pale ale yeast. Now, we're gonna close these up, let them ferment, do their thing, and then you'll next see me when we're adding the coconut shavings and the pineapple puree. And we're back. So it has now been a week and a half, or thereabouts, of fermentation, and we have had a little, little issue, which has held things up a bit. So it's very, very cold where we are at the moment in winter, and I didn't have heat belts connected to either of these. So fermentation on the uh, USO5 yeast, the split batch with the, um, the uh, you know, I guess the ale yeast, was slow, but it went ahead. The uh, version with the sour, with the Philly yeast in it, just halted altogether. So I took a sample a couple days ago when I originally wanted to do the, you know, coconut and the pineapple edition, and fermentation hadn't moved at all. Gravity was still sitting at 1.053, so basically nada. But, um, you know, easy fix. Where I'm a biotechnologist, it's, I know that it's easy as long as the yeast isn't dead, it can always be recovered. So basically just took it inside, whacked a heat belt on both of them, got them nice and warmed up, and fermentation has woken back up and kicked along. It's just kind of happened slower than we would have liked. Anyway, the point is now that the um, ale yeast version of the split batch is sitting at a gravity of about 1.01. .01. The sour yeast version still has a bit of ground to make up. It's sitting at about 1.02. 2.5 sort of territory, so this one still has about 15 points to go before it hits final gravity. But no matter, we're gonna go ahead and do this dry hopping anyway, because I don't mind if, uh, you know, we add this extra sugar now whilst the yeast is still going, it doesn't make all that much of a difference in my eyes anyway. So, here's how we're gonna do this. We have, once again, 500 grams or, you know, one pound each of toasted coconut shavings. And again, this was seven minutes in the oven at 180 degrees Celsius whatever that is in Fahrenheit up there. Um, and it's uh, all been toasted and it's good to go now. So we're gonna do 500 grams into each of these. We're also going to do crushed pineapple. So we're going 900 grams total of crushed pineapple. So that's about 1.8 pounds more or less of crushed pineapple. I'm also gonna whip it up a little bit in the blender uh, just to liquefy it a bit more and help with that interaction between the pineapple and the rest of the liquid. Just helps to get the flavor to carry over more if you're going with puree as opposed to like chunks or slices or anything like that. So the only other issue we're gonna face with all of this is when the beer starts coming out of that tap and going into the fermenter, uh, into, the, into the keg, sorry, either the line could get blocked, which will be a really annoying problem, or some of these little bits in here might carry over into the keg, in which case it could block the actual beer line when I'm trying to pour it out on tap. So my solution to all of that is brewing bag bags. So I have pre-sanitized two of these bags and it's just an ordinary, you know, nylon brewing a bag bag sort of thing. The idea is I'm gonna pour all the coconut shavings and the pineapple um, puree into that brewing a bag bag inside the bowl. Uh, and then we're just gonna whack it in the fermenter. All the juice that drains out, I'll then just, you know, pour in. So that way, at least, we are going to be able to actually separate all the chunks out of the liquid when we're transferring this into the keg and we're not gonna have any blocked line issues. So with all of that said, it's time to get blending. We're gonna go one fermenter at a time. Um, and we are using, by the way, um, crushed pineapple in syrup and it's golden circle if you know that's of interest to you. But I went with in syrup as opposed to in juice because I think the syrup just carries through a little bit more flavor. Might be slightly more artificial flavor, but I think it will carry a little bit more of that pineapple sweet acidity to it, which is really what we're going for with this. We want that pineapple flavor to carry across. Um, so I figured that was probably the better way to go. Anyway, that's what we're running with. You can make up your own mind and use fresh pineapple if you want to. That's totally fine. That's a good option as well. I just went with cans because easier and uh, pineapples aren't in season at the moment. So they're not as ripe as uh, I would like to use. So may as well just go with the cans. 
really need to stop closing these so tight. It's just not that necessary. Okay, and let's throw this bad boy in. Hmm, I didn't do this very well, actually. Let's go like that. Go in. Minimal mess. Nice, and I'm just realizing I forgot to tie this bag shut. Nice work, mate. There we go. All right, job done. Now, as that coconut starts to soak up all the liquid, it'll sink down to the bottom, and we should get maximum interaction between the coconut and the rest of the beer. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for sticking through this, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And from here, there's nothing left to do except uh, click on the next video that we'll release in a week from now where we taste each of these beers and get into the next Beer Battles episode where we're going Pina Colada Pale Ale versus Pina Colada Sour. So happy brewing, guys, and we'll catch you all soon. See ya.